Tom, welcome to Amazon Studios, brother. Uh, great to be here, Dwayne. Thanks yeah. so much for the invite. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Tom, before we get kicked off proper, proper, I think, um, you know, obviously, you know, we go way back, back into our uh, LBI publicist digital agency days, right? Yeah. Um, and then since then, you've gone on to do like bigger, bigger, broader things, right? You've been at Talk Talk, you've been at uh, Manchester United. Um, and more recently, you've been on Dazon as well. Talk me through like whole life has been since we worked together, man. This is twelve plus years, though. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, so um, for the last eight years or so, I've uh, worked at uh, client side subscription businesses, yeah. uh, leading large large teams in the retention space. So at Manchester United, I was head of CRM and venue marketing, nice. um, responsible for fan monetization and customer retention in the context, or fan retention in the context of the membership products and uh, hospitality products that, we, that have recurring revenue. Okay. Uh, also, um, Talk Talk, I was head of custom marketing there. And then more recently, I, w I was uh, SVP, Senior Vice President of Retention at DAZN, where I was responsible for retention analytics, customer value management, retention strategy, yeah. uh, and uh, CRM technology. Nice one, man. When I first moved to the UK, like, when we were working together, or you know, back then, those practices of personalization and analytics and CRM were very distinct businesses. They were very separate practices. Yeah. And obviously like, the market's kind of like normalized and it's converged. I know it kind of comes under the broader umbrella of, mar of marketing and of retention and they're very much interlocked. Yeah. Right. And you like, how have you seen like, you know, CRM subscription and retention like evolve over that period? Yeah, I mean, I think um, in terms of like technology, I remember we were sitting in uh, 2009 in, in the in the bar in LBI and <laughs> looking at a Martech diagram and there's like 200 kind of tech players in the, in the market at that time, 250. And that, I think it's a, the major Martech event last last week and there's like 11,000 vendors in the market, right? Yeah. So it's really, really easy for, for businesses to end up with quite a complicated tech stack, right? So mm -hmm. and what we've seen, as you said, is a much, much greater convergence across uh, across marketing functions. Um, because you, you you need to make sure that you're driving result. You don't you don't need to just plug in the tech, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then more broadly, in terms of you know what I've seen within the within the industry, within the subscription industry particularly, is is really it's grown tremendously in the last ten years due to kind of uh, three really interlocking factors. So yeah. firstly, technology. So the technology exists now for uh, any any business, large or small, to set up a subscription. Yeah. Right. So uh, you know, coaches, IoT, um, obviously streaming. Uh, even e-commerce, right? It's really, really easy for businesses to set up a subscription off offering. Yeah. Um, secondly, I think cons consumer appetite. So that we prefer access over ownership, um, and and um, you know the, the the streaming providers and the music providers are great examples of that. Uh, but also in e-commerce, right? It's, it's it's much much easier to um, to sign up for a subscription for a product that you regularly consume and use, right? Because we've got really busy lives. So there's a lot of consumer appetite for that. I would even argue that some brands use the subscription, like same posting and messaging to actually hook customers into something that's just a regular like, lease, for example. Oh, Does it come just for a different day, but you know what I mean? Like, oh, I understand like Porsche Passport and Evolvo Care, okay. they do that. Back in the day. Yeah, they go into get into the dealership, you know, with the attractive idea that you're going to have a 911 on the, in the week and a can on the weekends, and then you realize the price difference and you, and you take the lease. Massively different. Or you you got to at least, exactly right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you a lot of things. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> So, um, I, you know, I kind of wanted to, you, cause you touched on something there. Um, and I think like this whole idea of like a focus more on customer centricity and purpose, they grow up. Like I'd say that there's a difference though. Like, if I, if I go back five years, I think that there's a big shift and a lot of discussion around shareholder primacy and the shift towards customer centricity. But if we think like back to the last year in particular and the economic situations, I think a lot of brands have kind of like deprioritized that. A lot of teams and CX central central CX teams have been disbanded. But, but what are you seeing on your side? Are you seeing the same things? Or? Yeah, no, hundred percent. I think. Look, um, the, firstly, there's like overwhelming evidence that customer centricity drives business value. Yeah. But it's a medium term game, right? Like you know, probably a lot of the viewers will be familiar with the Team Mobile case study in the US, where you know they're hovering around thirty million subscribers for several years and then tripled in the space of seven years. But it took seven years, right? Through a really comprehensive program of yeah. uh, you know, customer centric initiatives. But you've got to be brave. You've got to be really brave. You've got to yeah. have the right leadership to be able to be brave to do that. And the problem is that most organizations are operating on a quarterly cycle or an annual cycle at, at very best. Mm -hmm. And they're looking for real, real short term returns from their customer experience initiatives. And I, I've seen the same pattern that you're seeing as well, more, more broadly, is that CX teams are being disbanded mm -hmm. um, um, because there isn't that patience there. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe that the, the, the problem is not just the patience, the problem is also the, the focus. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, the way I look at it is, and in, in my experience, 
if you focus your customer experience initiatives on everything, all customers, mm -hmm. all touch points, mm -hmm. and you've got a huge program, right? You've got a huge investment. It's going to take a very long time to see any return. And you might get the T-Mobile return. You might not, but you're going to wait seven years. The way that I see, see that you get the best results is by focusing on particular groups of customers right. and focus, focusing on particular moments in the relationship. So when I think about groups of customers, right, in subscription businesses, 20% of your customers will deliver 80% of the battery, approximately. It varies by business, but approximately, right? The Pareto's law is everywhere. It's in the natural environment. It is like it's a universal law. Yeah, it's in business, it's in everything, right? So, and if you focus your um, CX initiatives on those highest value customers, um, then you'll see a much greater return. Like if you become very attentive to minor problems and you really focus on those customers because the relationship in subscription businesses, they contribute 80% of the revenue that you start the year with, right? So, but also that means that you've got a lot, uh, you know, a lot smaller audience to focus on. The other aspect is it focus on the right moments. So what I've seen a lot of CX teams do both in my consultancy time and in, in my time in senior client side roles is, is that there's a CX team that have a kind of an opinion on everything, right? They, yeah. they are, oh, well, we need to have an opinion on that, yeah. and on that, and on that, and it's, that. It's but a, that having a real clear focus. It's almost as though, like, you know, if you get, I remember there was a, this, this really influential uh, article, I think it was from McKinsey, where it was this whole idea of centralized CX versus embedded CX. And it's almost as though, like, the latter is one. It's kind Absolutely. Of one top, you know? But I think it's the right way, right? Like, if you've got a CX team and they're, they're a small team and they're yeah. going to influence a big organization, they're not going to be able to be spread so thin that it's going to be really, really difficult in order to drive or drive value. So mm -hmm. in my opinion, absolutely, it has to be an embedded CX proposition. And it starts with their leadership. You focus on the right customers, focus on the most valuable customers first, because those are the ones that are going to protect your revenues. And then secondly, focus on those moments of truth, focus on moments in the customer relationship that make or break that relationship. And subscription businesses are all about customer relationships. And so if you think, there's a, you can use your data and you can use your analytics to understand when customers are likely to churn or is there a moment that triggers greater retention through the way in which we've interacted or serviced the customer. And you can use that insight then to really streamline your CX initiatives and your, and your retention initiatives on the right customers at the right moments. Then you will avoid the problems that many CX initiatives and programs have, which is spiraling cost. But it still requires leadership focus. This is not like a, it still requires an overarching strategy to do that. Yeah. And then it requires execution within the teams because, you know, strategy is nothing without execution. But tell me something then, because tell me what you think about this. Because I, I kind of think back to, you know, 2012, 2011, and, you know, a lot of the telcos and media companies had like, like data planners, yeah. different types of planners. And the idea was that they take the insights and they they go into specific teams to spin up tiger teams to drive specific, you know, outcomes of customers. And it was very tactical. Yeah. And I, and I, and I thought that, the market is went away from that and it was the, this kind of bigger, more strategic focus on CX. And it's almost as though we circled back to that. Yeah, I know. I th I mean, I, well, I'd say that strategy is nothing without tactics, right? You can have this glorious strategy, but if you don't execute it, then it's just words on a page, right? You, you need that overarching direction. So if you, if you focus this, the right customers at the right moments, then you get into how do you execute that? So maybe, you know, I think the, the, and the, you know, our experience of, of telcos and data powers, was probably not quite the same as that in that it was more more um, individuals were given a mantra to look at data yeah. and find out problems and yeah. then help teams, right? Because yeah. no one was really quite clear in those days exactly sure. how you're going to yeah. use data. Yeah, the, right? the teams themselves were using the data. Right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, Whereas I think now it's more about, you know, you need an overarching strategy, but your strategy can't be, we're going to deliver great CX if you want like a short-term return. You have, your strategy has to be focus on the right people at the right moments. I, I want to touch on that because I tell you this, no, I remember you know, kind of leaving LBI and going into consulting and a lot of like, the big like transformation programs I was part of back then, I really struggled with that idea, you know, the idea of focusing more resources on one group of customers and the other. It was like, that's insane. You know, you know, if you think about like the mass market brands, you know, that would probably squirm at the idea of doing that, you know, but it, it, not, that I, not that I don't think it works. I seen it work. We know it works, well, works. right? But then you know, I could also understand brands who feel uncomfortable with that idea because essentially this is what they got to do, right? They got to either create little alternative propositions so that they can actually focus and double down on the kind of, you know, no one wants to create underserved audiences, no. right? So they've got to create these alternative, maybe value brands or whatever, so that they could double down on those audiences and then create stepping stones for them, no? 
Is that is that a rate? If I got yeah, it right, look, one hundred percent. Yeah, well, I totally agree with that. Right, you know, you need to put, create pathways for your lowest value customers to become mid value and to become high value. Um, and on some contexts, it's investment, don't. Yeah, I mean, in some cases, it also makes it makes sense to have a um, an additional brand to serve a specific audience, yeah. but but it's not necessary in a vast majority of cases. Yeah. Um, in the way the way the way I look at this is, it's not about underserving the low value customers, right? It, it's it's about giving them an you know underserving to the degree that results in complaints on social media and negativity around the brand, right? It, it's about giving them an acceptable level of service. So if you think about um, uh, and a high value customer say you're a high value customer of a bank yeah. and you call your bank because you've got a problem you expect the, the phone to be answered pretty quickly yeah. you expect your problem to be resolved right because yeah. you know you've got a lot of funds yeah. with that, that particular bank yeah. but on the other scale, side of the scale like if you're a customer of a streaming provider and you dip in every now and then you watch a fight or you watch a bit of football and then you go out and you've got a problem you don't necessarily expect to kind of have your problem resolved straight away like you know AI bot might help you or you, you might, might expect to do some you know, diving into the FAQs to 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 understand how your problem can be resolved. So, absolutely not about um, underserving customers. It's right. just about living the right level of acceptable service. Yeah. yeah. And then what I see, like, in, and we've talked a lot already about like how a lot of CX teams have been disbanded, and you know, it's a common trend because of the they don't see quick returns. The the, the board. But what what I, what I see is there's two different types of organisation, right? Broadly. There's those that are focused just on short-term profit, right? So, and they will do everything to maximize revenue. And it's kind of understandable, right? Subscription founders, they're in the business to make profit. But the mm. problem is, if you do you do things like introduce notice fees, you make you do poor service handoffs, you make cancellation incredibly difficult. Yeah. You introduce issues that cause challenges for your high-value customers. You've got to turn them off, right? Yeah. And then the other end of the scale, you've got the, the organizations that are completely focused on customer centricity and want to deliver brilliant experiences for everyone. Yeah. But the, the but the issue with that is lots of your customers are born to you low value, right? Mm -hmm. They will they because of the fit between your product and service and what you offer, mm -hmm. they're never going to become high value. You provide them a path to get to high value, but they're never going to become high value because mm -hmm. just the nature of their individual needs doesn't fit your product, right? Mm -hmm. So if you invest huge amounts in CX for those customers, yeah. you're not going to see a return. Right. So, so this is also, in a sense, optimizing resources, and I guess that moves very well in these in these types of times as well. Right? Absolutely, yeah. it's about optimizing resources. If you focus on your highest value customers, you can understand uh, drivers of value. You can optimize resources, and in many cases, you can reduce cost, right, uh, as well as drive improvements in retention. I like this. I mean, I want to switch gears a bit because I I spent some time looking at a lot of like your content from your coaching program um and you know I think the, the, a few times you called out how brands um they don't always get things like customer lifting value quite right and creating cool yeah. parts to go to guide you know their customer strategy I want you to shed a little bit of light on that if you don't mind yeah no absolutely no I um um, I might not be able to quote, be quoted on this, but um, uh, Rusty Warner is a friend of mine, and he mentioned to me that the work that they've done, and they've seen eighty percent of um, customers that are using customer lifetime value aren't measuring it correctly. Uh, and I've seen that as well in organisations that I've been part of, consulted to, uh, and, and effectively, what the vast majority of those organisations are doing is taking historic spend, mm -hmm. summing up at a customer level, and treating that as CLV. CLV is not just historic spend. It is that is an element to it, but it's also predicted future spend as well as the network impacts of referrals. And sometimes in media businesses, like uh, if you play some content in social media or share or like some content, and that can drive uh, acquisitions through the content that you engage with. So uh, it includes all those com those components. And if you use all of those components, you can get a, a true understanding of customer value. But there's there's another layer deeper than that as well in terms of how you actually make the calculation. So um, a lot of brands, when they're calculating CLV, will use like churn tenures, so that the average life of customers um, who've left the business, yeah. but your existing customers will always have a longer tenure than you. Yeah. So, so you need to use probabilistic models to predict, or even rules-based models to predict the, the likelihood the customers will stay and how long that they will stay for. Right. The other thing is um, a lot of brands will use an average retention rate. So if you just like kind of imagine a... A, a, a line chart with a long the x-axis yeah. um, time and then on the um, y-axis percentage like a, a kind of straight line retention rate across all of the different renewal periods a lot of brands will apply that that's always always wrong right um, the, the way it works within subscription businesses is you get much higher churn in the first few renewal periods right. and then as customers become more and more um, loyal to you 
then and more and more engaged and the product becomes more and more better than their life, the tenure actually extends. So if you use a straight line retention rate, um, then you will actually undercall CLV as well. Yeah. Um, so that's also really important. And the, and the last point on CLV as well is you need to take a cohort view. Mm-hmm. Like um, when you first start your business, when you first start your subscription business, the first customers you attract will be your lowest hanging fruit, right? They'll be the customers that have um, um, the closest product fit to your offer, right? Their, their, their needs are really, really closely fit to your offer. Right. So the ones that are still with you now, uh, obviously, um, going to have much longer tenure than customers that you acquire, you know, very, very recently, say five years down the line, who, who maybe have a, a, a lot looser fit to, 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 to in terms of their needs to your product. Yeah. Um, other things to watch out for seasonality yep. it's a big thing in sports uh, but in other industries as well and then also marketing promo effects like acquiring somebody on a one dollar one month trial of course they're going to have um, lower CLV and lower tenure than somebody who's uh, maybe taking an upfront commitment and, at full price that actually like buy into subscriptions for specific sports sport events and that kind of thing yeah. it just made me think about something you know I think you know go back to the time when I dabbled in the like, lead like, analytics teams you know and you know, getting costs to serve was one of the hardest things that you could do. Yeah. And I remember back then, a lot of the tools had um, like out of the box metrics and real customer lifting. It wasn't really customer lifting value. It was more like, you know, like like revenue per tenure. Yeah. Right. Um, let's say that you mentioned before, right? Yeah, start with. And I think that that's where a lot of that the influence coming from, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, specifically going to bring this up because if you, you know, if you're in an analytics team and your and your job is to try to understand like cost of serve from different teams, that's really hard. So is there is there is it okay to start with what you've got and then build up? Hundred yeah. percent, definitely start start up. You know, uh, start with building blocks and build up your. The sophistication of your models you know you might not include referrals at the start for example you might have a referral program right you might not include network impact cost to serve you might bring that in later yeah. uh, i think cost to serve really only becomes really important in customer lifetime value if you're offering like differentiated, differentiated service yeah fair experiences yeah. so like you're investing a lot more in your high value customers yeah. and you need to see the return for but that in terms of it, the, the, the but doesn't it is it important when you start to get into things like segmentation and cohorts though because you kind of want to see like the cost to serve, like I don't know, a promoter versus a tractor or a high value versus a tractor. Hundred percent, yeah, it's important. It's important to bring it in, but just you know, take it in stages. Yeah, you know, get more and more sophisticated through time. But but you know, don't don't uh, leverage historic profitability because that's the customer and assume that you've done it right. You mm-hmm. absolutely need to first but build in future predicted spend, and you, you should ideally, if you've got enough data and you've got the resources, build probabilistic models to predict that extended tenure. But you can also do that rules based to start with, right? Yeah. Um, I want to stick to your kind of coaching content because I think there's a lot of rich stuff inside there. Actually, there was two more things actually that I want to touch with you on. Um, the first thing was around customer data platforms. It was something that you said, uh, I think it was about um how they pro- I think it was about creating a lifeline for data debt, right? Uh, shed some light on that one. Though. Yeah, sure. So I mean, look. I think we've had this concept of a single customer view for many years. Yeah, yeah. Had, you know, access to data warehouses and um, um, d- uh, data platforms, and then the marketing folk are like, I need the data guys, right? And they still haven't got access to the data they need in order to drive the experiences they want to drive, right? And that's where the kind of CDP market has emerged from, right? And um, yeah. and I think, um, but then you get the, another problem with the CDP market, where it's, there's not enough focus within the the marketing functions to understand exactly what, what they truly need. And you can end up with a, pro- a situation where, oh, we just get everything. And then you get like a replication of your data warehouse in your CDP. Uh-huh. Also also not needed, right? So, you mean. so this kind of refers back to my point before about uh, moments of truth, right? So okay. if you understand those moments of truth and you understand when customers have reached those moments of truth, yeah. then you can deliver experiences to them that uh, translate into incremental retention. So um, because ultimately incremental retention is driven off the va- the inherent value of your customer data and the way in which you use it. Because all your customers are born to you at a certain level of goodness, whether they're high, medium, or low value. And if you use your data intelligently, then you can drive incremental retention over and above their inherent goodness. Right. And so the way to do that is to to identify when customers have reached a moment of truth or predict when they're likely to. Likely to. And then use like ethnographic research or qual research to understand what's happening in the customer's life, right? Because customers... Your product doesn't have value, right? 
and this might hopefully not seem shocking for people listening, but <laughs> it's the, it's the, reali the realization of, of the value of the product comes when the customer's usual product, right? Yeah. So the Netflix app sitting in, on your phone or sitting on your on your TV screen, yeah. not being used, has zero value, right? No matter what everybody in Netflix is doing. Yeah. It, it has value when it's something to occupy the kids or when it's something to, um, uh, to have a day night with your partner or when you just need to unwind and, you know, watch a show. Yeah. So um, uh, what you need to understand is what is the, the context of the value creation of the product yeah. at those mo moments of truth? Yeah. And then you can use data to predict when customers arrive at those moments. Yeah. And then you can... Um, serve experiences that tap into how customers create value around your service or product also hold on let me play that back let me play that back so are you suggesting and keep me honest eh? so you're suggesting that you know you would use so you, let's go back to the analogy of using your ethnographic research so you understand you know, what customers the kind of broader context what customers are doing to the left or right of engaging with you right yeah. and they need yeah right and i think what you're saying and keep me honest here that you would then use that to inform not only what you collect and the kind of breadth of things that you will collect, but I think most importantly, the moments that you want to drive further than the stream. So there's be me when you say moments of truth is like, you know, the particular messages at the right time, yeah. getting them and guiding them to, predict, to, to to watch programs that they love and enjoy. Exactly. So in digital service, it's really easy, right? Because you've, you know, sure. you've got the actual product where you can serve experiences, but across any different type of product or sector. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, effectively all customers uh, in a subscription context because they have an ongoing relationship with you mm. are always asking questions like am I valued do I really need this mm. I think I should go maybe I shouldn't is this useful you know they're always asking these questions even like subconsciously asking these questions mm. yeah and um, the moments of truth are those interactions that provide platform for much greater retention and longer life like so when you deliver something that really delights a customer I mean, in order to really delight a customer, you need to understand the context in which in which they create value from use of your service or product. But it also goes the other way as well, right? There can be those moments that really trigger, like, churn and a disassociation with the brand and a, mm -hmm. a negative relationship with the brand. Yeah. And, you know, Fred Reichold in Winning on Purpose talks about this a lot, and bad profits, and, you know, these kind of interactions that um, extract revenue from your highest value customers may look good on the balance sheet for a quarter but over the long term they're not good for the relationship and subscription businesses are about relationships you want to get to a point where you've delighted your customers so much you have such a great relationship with your customers they're actually willing to pay more yeah yeah well they're trying to trick money from them mm -hmm. right because they have a they have such a deep entrenched um, relationship with you as a brand and they're so connected to you as a brand and um and the evidence for this is just so strong now, right? You know, there's 20, 2003, I think, when uh, NPS was invented, yeah. Lynch by Bain, and then yeah. just so much evidence. And, you know, I, I, I really think we should see more focus towards it. I'll tell you two stories, right? Um, so I'll tell you the first story is around, so my internet provider, who shall not be named, um, you know, my internet went down, I think for a couple of houses and, you know, I called them up, you know, I think maybe there was something physically wrong with the cabling or whatever. And, and well, one, they didn't know. Um, two, I coincidentally, I bought a product from them that was meant to kick in and give me a kind of backup internet connection and did not work. He did not know. Right. And that really stuck with me. I did see your point, right? That really changed your relationship. I mean, I am no so bent against not being with that brand anymore. Yeah. I really want to win. That was the moment of truth for you. Yeah, it was like, I want, oh. Right? Yeah, I mean, even if they said, look, we'll look into this right away for you and you got back to you in half an hour and they'd resolve the problem, even if you didn't know at that moment, but it's probably more to do with the fact that they, they didn't know, they didn't resolve it, right? You, you do, you won't get that informed. That really frustrated me. So I'll tell you a second story. So energy provider this time, so you know everything's going on and you, know, you got your increased energy prices and everything. And I, I remember I was at work, I was running a workshop and got this email saying, oh, by the way, you know, you've overpaid us. You know, the tariff that you've got is the wrong tariff. Here's some money back, credit in your account. You know, we actually just, re just deduct it over the month. So it was like, what? Yeah, you feel really good about that. And then, and then when they put the prices up, then they send you an email next year with a price increase, you'll be fine with it. Because you know that they've done good okay, by you in the past. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I really love, I really love, I think, I think it, 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 this, it is just something you said just kind of triggered those two things in my mind. I think they're really, you know, they're really kind of, they've called out to me. Um, 
we we can't do a podcast without covering genitive AI, right? Um, uh, and again, the thing I, I, I get I'm looking at your coaching with like content, um, there's something that you said on there. I'll try to remember it. Um, that really stuck with me. It kind of takes me back as well. It was around how generative AI. I think you said something about um, uh, kind of like delivers on the promise. The, yeah, the original promise of 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 micro segmentation. Yeah, that takes me back, boy. Because yeah. I remember if you go back to the content targeting days, yeah. right? And we were giving you micro segments back then. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And like, like it was the content team that weren't able to do anything with that. They didn't have the batteries of yeah. people and exactly hundred percent. That was always the problem, right? So we probably twenty years we've been able to um, you know identify micro clusters yeah. and deliver unique bespoke experience to them, whether that be in products or in zero marketing or in service and so on. Um, particularly in products though, and in zero marketing, this has always been really, really difficult to execute against it because the vast amount of content you need in order to be able to execute against the micro segment it's, it's so tremendous yeah. that it became it became nearly impossible i mean i think there's brands like amazon have done a very good job right and, and other um uh, e-commerce retailers where you kind of tag models of content yeah. and then you can serve you know people like who, who bought that also like that well that's been going on for quite a long time and yeah. many brands do that we've yeah. done that before in my previous roles what gen ai allows us yeah. to do is yeah. Yeah. to go a level beyond that like yeah. rather than just saying like you bought that same models like this we can attach the emotion around it. Like right. you can create a, 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 we can create a connection with the customer yeah. at like a micro cluster level, yes. leveraging the capabilities that Gen AI, uh, Genesive AI provides so that the, the, the customer feels more attracted to that additional service or that it's a content module or, you know, because it's based on your understanding of that individual cohort. Yeah. And my, my, with my coaching program, I've got a seven step, program for leveraging AI for micro segmentation and one of the key components of that is organization and how you think about your creative resources yeah so unfortunately I, what I've seen is some organizations thought oh general AI great I don't need a creative team anymore I'll, I'll give it to you know the 21 year old at a university yeah. with a business degree yeah, yeah. It's absolutely not the right thing to do right I, I believe that creative people need to lean into AI and they need to be, uh, become editors and prompt engineers yeah. but as a business you absolutely need creative people vetting the content that comes out of Gen AI, briefing it and making sure that it's aligned to the brand promise and the brand value. To so the larger editorial aspect. So the larger editorial oh. view and the brand vision. Yeah. And then so so if you have um you know your designers and your copywriters yeah. um driving those briefs and reviewing that the content that the AI produces um and editing the content the AI produces, their roles change fundamentally, but you can scale and you can scale that like, hugely effectively as well. But this is the second way of the skill for that group, right? And, you know, it should be got like ex-colleagues and current colleagues that would be like, what are they talking about? They got it wrong. But I know this is when like, you know, the customer, the, the content management system, sorry, were really coming into form and the, those capabilities, like the content capability was formalizing. So you went from like, you know, really scrappy, like, you know, people like doing content editing into like, you know, team to the structure, content strategy, and, you know, you know, brands were grappling with you know, disseminating different types of, you know, assets to different brands, or agencies. Yeah. And no, this is different. It's a different type of skill. This is like another layer. This below is that. that. That still is needed. Yeah. And it's the next level below that. Yeah. Uh, I, I focused on different cohorts of customers, which which have different customer needs and, and realize value in different ways and in different contexts. Yeah. Uh, exciting, man. Um, before we close, I wanted to, I wanted to give something back to um, like the, you know, the marketing practitioners out there, right? So like the young Toms mm. or even the more experienced Toms, mm. right? Um, you know, and it kind of trying to think about how we would frame it, but maybe I wonder if you can give maybe like three things that they should be thinking about in terms of that mindset change. So if we, if we kind of play about what we went through, we went through uh, customer centricity. We, we talked about um, how you could like segment and focus on specific customers versus other customers. Um, what are the things, the three things that you that they should be focusing on? So, I mean, firstly, you know, focus on customer value creation, especially within your, within your highest value customer cohort, right? So, um, that can drive a huge return. Then, um, a, a, another two things I think, particularly talking about subscription businesses again, or retention in subscription businesses, is um, firstly onboarding. Mm -hmm. So, um, lots of brands will look at their customer base and they'll see that you know, got say an average life of seven months, for yeah. example, yeah. right? So they'll think, okay, we'll add some value at month six. 
and then nothing happens. And the, and the reason for that is actually you have a curve where there's a huge proportion of customers that churn the first 90 days and then a very, 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 very long tail. So when you actually just drop something at month six, you're only affecting like a tiny proportion of customers, right? So it has no incremental impact. And where you really need to focus is on the first 90 days of the relationship. And uh, if you can deliver onboarding programs that get customers to a result really, really fast, get them to a benefit of your product or service, which provides real value for them really, really quickly, ideally within like the first seven days, um, that's really important. And then secondly, like using nudge theory to encourage customers to undertake actions that benefit uh, then in terms of their long-term engagement in your product or service and everyone will probably remember it's probably going back a bit now but when you first signed up to linkedin and then a profile percentage profile completed and you just wanted to get it to 100 percent, right <laughs> that's an exact example of that right so just encouraging you to do those those small little things to get more value out of the product yeah. so that, that that would be a big tip and really focus on boarding and lots of subscription businesses it can be upwards of 50 percent of the um of the total volume of churn right, right. so um and, and some businesses don't even split it out when they're looking at churn rates so absolutely really important to, that, to, to focus on that audience that, that would mean though that like things like cool so i think putting my recommendation hat on oh you know that would mean that things like cool starts are really important really important. you you need to be like banging on like suggestions in terms of next steps and nudges absolutely i'm yeah. upset and when you see that level of engagement that you need you don't need to go excessive about it let them kind of enjoy the products and service um, but um, but yeah, um, give get them to value, but don't overwhelm them. There's a real balance, I think. Um, they're not getting value; they're not using your service. You need to you need to really push. And then and then in life, what I would say is um, a real, you know, important part of sustaining retention in a subscription business is embedding the products and service into the customer's life. So, um, like James Clear talks about this in Atomic Habits. So you walk into a room and there's a plate of freshly baked cookies on the table. Yeah. Even if you're not hungry, uh, you've maybe had your lunch uh, and you, you, you like need to want to have a cookie, right? It's because it's, it's proximity. It's right in front of you. Yeah. So like in life, if customers demonstrate particular behavior, or even if they don't, like encouraging them to take a specific action. So, you know, you get the push note to do the meditation, you're much more likely to do the meditation, right? Um, and then the other aspects of embedding in customers' lives relates to um, how you can provide value over and above what the, what the product and service is, but but which supports the, the wider customer context. Yeah. So thinking about B2B, SaaS businesses, yeah. you know, blog posts, social content that co- talk to customers' core needs, events even. You know, Salesforce have been very successful at that. Yeah. Um, uh, even this podcast, for example, right? Providing value to your um, your, your um, su- subscription audience um, that's over and above the core intrinsic value of the service, that can get you more embedded into the into the customer's life as well. All right, and then the trip for you up now. Um, what about things that they should avoid maybe one thing that they should avoid you think one thing to avoid is customer alienation you know customer alienation you talked about your example with your, your telco provider with the broadband yeah um but there's so many examples of customer alienation particularly alienating your high, uh, highest value customers is absolutely something to avoid yeah. you know i even saw a super bowl ad last year big big ad acquisition deal only available for new customers existing customers you're excluded from this offer right in the Super Bowl, you know, this is really bad practice, you know. Right, right. Don't do things to alienate your customers. Make sure that you can you can um, you know, encourage affiliation rather than encouraging that alienation. Um, so that means you kind of got to be aware of all your processes and how they work as well. Tom, look, man, this is great. Um, before we head out, though, where could people find your work? Where can people find more, Tom? Yeah, so I've got a, a retention accelerator coaching program, which yeah. um, it covers a lot of the things that we've talked about today. Yeah. So how do you extend tenure? How do you increase value? It has a build CLV actually and, and progress through the um, the development of sophistication. Okay. Um, and it's based on a set of systems and frameworks because yeah. I believe that actually systems and frameworks drive results, not goals. Yeah. Um, it includes over 150 case studies. Um, it leans on thinking from 50 of the greatest minds and, and 60,000 hours of practical retention experience as well. Yes. Um, plants go on a, uh, have a brief assessment. It's a 12 week program. And then we, uh, the program is entirely optimized for the client's unique business. Oh. Focused on how we can fast track retention at that, um, at that subscription business. So if you, if any of the listeners want to find out more about it, yeah. please go to www.retention.coach. Uh, there's no.com, no.co.uk at the end of it. It's just .coach, retention.coach. So, uh, and you can book a call with me. So there you go. Appreciate it, man.